Hello everyone, welcome to episode 2 of the African Five-A-Side podcast. Uh, brief apologies for the week off. Uh, this week I've had to move back to Algeria and there were a few difficulties in some of the logistics of moving back. But uh, without further ado, um, episode 2 of the African Five-A-Side podcast uh, is a podcast where we're profiling uh, the fa- our favorite heads of state in African football. And once again, we're not endorsing any of their policies. Uh, we're rather examining the relationship uh, between football and politics. And um, we left off with the bench. And on our bench, we have three heads of state. We had the former Algerian president, Ahmed Ben Bella. We had the former Libyan leader, Muammar Gaddafi. And we also had the former Nigerian president, Namdi Azikwe. So now we're in our five-a-side team. This is our actual team that we're putting out. And we're starting with the goalkeeper. Uh, I gave you a hint last time that the goalkeeper is tall, he's handsome, uh, he smokes like a... Gemal Abdel Nasser. So, the first question that I would have is why would we have one of the most important leaders in African history, one of the more important leaders of the non line movement, at the goalkeeping position. Usually at the goalkeeping position, you put players that are not the best footballers. Um, well, we did it because Nasser is tall. He's charismatic. He's a great communicator. He can communicate with his defense. And most crucially, we're just not that sure that he enjoyed football all that much. Nasser grew up in a modest family, the son of a postal worker, um, and they really bounced a lot in his youth. Uh, he spent times in rural cities and in towns as well as uh, Egypt's two biggest cities, Cairo and Alexandria. Um, and eventually he sent to Cairo for school at his uncle's. And I poured over articles and podcasts and I even read some of his biography and never once found any mention of interest in football as a child or young adult. So that's hint number one, that he wasn't all that interested in sport or football. But what we're going to see, Nasser actually used football for political and military purposes. So Nasser, as a young man, uh, we we see signs that he's politically active. Um, He's in leading student demonstrations uh, against, you know, colonial rule. He's reading a lot of very interesting books. He's he's in theater. And really, we see all the ingredients of his future personality uh, sort of mixed in until he joins the military academy in 1937. And this is where he meets his future right-hand man, Abdel Hakim Amr, and his successor, Anwar Sadat. There were a few episodes that really disillusioned Nasser with the colonial system. And the first one was when Egyptian sovereignty was trampled, uh, when the British regime forced regime change. Uh, in Egypt to really bolster the efforts during the Second World War. Uh, And then finally, the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, uh, where Nasser reportedly fought very admirably, uh, but that was seen as like a big humiliation for the entire Arab world and especially Egypt. And as a result, I think many, many of the Egyptian military officials were quite disillusioned with their leadership and they decided when they got back to Egypt to form something called the Free Officers Movement. Sadat, Amr, Nasser were all part of the Free Officers Movement, as was um, Mohammed Naguib, who was sort of the senior member. And when they carried out a coup in 1952, um, they dismantled the monarchy with King Farouk at its head. And Mohammed Naguib, the senior officer, was the president and Nasser was the vice president. When you hear people at the time speak, they mostly say that Nasser was always in charge. He was always the, the energy. He was always the juice. But Naguib was the senior officer, and as a result, he was the uh, he was the person that they sort of needed um, at the head. I give you all this political background to show you how Nasser gets to where he gets to. But now let's delve into the sport and football aspect of it all. So in 1952, they carried out the revolution. Immediately, immediately, we start seeing football and sport being instrumentalized. So during that season, 1951-1952, the league championship is canceled due to the revolution. And the national team do, however, participate in the 1952 Summer Olympics. I believe they beat Chile in the first round and they lose to West Germany, uh, I believe, in the quarterfinals. However, the Egyptian Cup and the Cairo League were played quite normally. Um, 
here's another way that they really sort of made it clear that sport was going to be mixed in with politics. Um, we all know Zamalek. Zamalek is one of the biggest clubs in Africa. Uh, Zamalek, from 1941 to 1952, was named Nadi Farouk al the club of Farouk I, who was the, the king of Egypt at the time. And after 1952, after the revolution, the club was renamed Zamalek, as we know it today, after the area where the club is situated, the neighborhood that the club is situated uh, or was situated in. And so, again, we see like these symbols of the monarchy being erased, not only, you know, on the street or in monuments, but also in football. Finally, in 1955, uh, Israel carries out a series of incursions in the Gaza Strip, which at the time was under Egyptian control. And this was interesting because Nasser uses the Cairo Derby as a fundraiser with all the proceeds of the tickets going into humanitarian and military efforts. Um, and in addition to football, he also asks, you know, artists like, you know, Um Kulthum, the, the famous uh, Egyptian singer, one of the most famous, the, I would say the most famous in the, in the Arab world. Um, they hold a concert and again, the proceeds are going to fund this you know, war effort and these humanitarian uh, costs. Um, so very immediately in the first three years of his reign, we have very clear examples of Nasser instrumentalizing using football for political means. <clears throat> now, one of the main points of Nasser's politics is that he's very pan-Arab, he's very pan-African. Nasser was really one of the mo foremost resources for a lot of the decolonization movements in the Middle East and in Africa. So, for example, he's one of the main actors at the Bandung Conference, which was a precursor to the Manline movement. Uh, another example is that he supports the Algerian War of Independence against the French uh, since its inception in 1954, not only providing the, the FLN with uh, weapons, but also diplomatic support and military training as well. And so what Nasser has this policy of, you know, uh, unity across the global south and, and sort of raising everyone rising together. And he wants to create institutions that reflect his political philosophy. And so we come to one of the parts of his story that I'm most interested in is the creation of the Confederation of African Football. In 1954, the Asian Football Confederation is created as well as UEFA. UEFA is also created in 1954. And Africa realizes, you know, we should also create our own confederation. Now, the problem is that the vast majority of the continent is still colonized. There are only three or four federations that are really truly independent. Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, and South Africa. And so this is one of the things that's very interesting is how much of Nasser's directives were used to create the Confederation of African Football. There's no clear evidence that Nasser said, let's create CAF, and he charged his you know, government officials with doing that. However, however, it's very, very difficult to imagine that Egyptian officials took that initiative without his approval, and I would even say without his initiative. So Abdul Aziz Abdullah Salam, an agricultural engineer uh, in Egypt, was uh, at the time the, the leader of the Egyptian FA uh, at the FIFA Congress in 1954 in Bern. Um, he goes up and he makes this very impassioned speech about the need to create an African football confederation. Um, he's Cambridge educated, uh, very, a technocrat, very intelligent, and he impressed the delegates so much that they agreed. Two years later uh, was the next FIFA Congress in Lisbon at the Hotel Avenida. And here uh, FIFA says they give them the green light. And here Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia and South Africa agree to draft the bylaws and create the Confederation of African Football. And they do so. Um, yet there were a few different issues. The first issue is that South Africa is still very much an apartheid state. And this runs contra to not only Nasser's philosophy, but even you know the political ideas of uh, the Emperor Selassie uh, in Ethiopia. Um, what's happening really all over the continent was we have this wave of decolonization and uh, South Africa's apartheid uh, politics fly in the face of that. So South Africa is immediately excluded from the inaugural Africa Cup of Nations. But then there's a huge obstacle in 1956 as well. Um, it's a political obstacle. And 
it's the Suez Crisis. So for those that don't know, in July 1956, in front of hundreds of thousands of people, Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalizes the Su Suez Canal. This is a move that you have to put back in its context to understand. Um, at the time, most of the world's trade really passes through the Suez Canal, especially, especially, you know, before we had gas pipelines, you know, fuel, petrol, all of that was passing through the Suez Canal. And the Suez Canal was run by this international consortium, a lot of different actors, but mostly British. The British had a lot of economic interest there. Um, and so the Suez Canal was going to become Egyptian in 1966 anyways. But Nasser took the, you know, again, like he always does, takes the initiative in 1956 and says, no, this is on Egyptian territory. This is Egyptian. We're going to nationalize it. We're going to compensate the consortium and the different investors at a fair price. But this is ours and we're taking it now. And so there's a huge uproar. Nasser is being compared to Hitler in the press, uh, being called all kinds of names, terrorists, etc. Um, the British organize with the French, who see this as an opportunity to attack Nasser because of uh, the logistical support that he's providing the Algerian revolutionaries. And Israel also joins in to what we end up calling the tripartite aggression. And the problem that Israel wanted was uh, they wanted access, shipping access, that Egypt was denying them at the time. And so there's the tripartite invasion in uh, the summer of 1956. Uh, Egypt is outnumbered, they're outpowered, and this tripartite aggression lasts three months. So this is six months prior to the African Cup of Nations. And the aggression lasts for three months, and eventually the Soviet Union, the United States, step in and they say, hey, we're putting an end to this. And this was really seen as probably the moment in history when British Britain, Great Britain no longer was uh, a superpower. And same thing with France, no longer a superpower. And the, the world's great superpowers emerged as the United States and the Soviet Union. So um, tripartite aggression finishes a few months before the Africa Cup of Nations. Egypt is, in theory, in no way, shape or form ready to host an Africa Cup of Nations. Uh, they decide to host it in Sudan. But still, if you don't have South Africa playing because CAF refuses to let them submit an all-black or an all-white team, and if you don't have Egypt, who at the time is quite clearly the best African footballing nation in the world, they participated in several Summer Olympic Games, they participated in the FIFA World Cup, you only have two teams, Ethiopia and Sudan. Are we going to cancel the Cup of Nations? These are all the things that are very much in jeopardy, swirling around at the time. And here, I really admire what Nasser did because throughout his reign, he mostly boycotted and uh, withdrew his national teams and shut down national leagues for political purposes. But here, it seems like the Egyptian authorities made a concerted effort to keep Egypt in the African Cup of Nations. And this sets a tone for the tournament that lasts until present day. Think about the African Cup of Nations. Just over the last 10 to 15 years, think about how many times a host has had to pull out. Think of all the different problems, whether it's, you know, the Ebola uh, epidemic of 2015, where we had to move from Morocco hosting the tournament to Equatorial Guinea in a matter of months. Think about, you know, the, the most recent AFCON uh, in Cameroon with all the problems that COVID posed. Um, think about, you know, the Libya civil war. Libya was supposed to host the tournament in 2013, 2017. There are so many different problems on the African continent. Yet, 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 every two years, we have this tournament. No matter what the issues are, I've, I've, speak, I've, spoken, to, I've spoken to African uh, administrators, football administrators, that were telling me about, you know, flying in a pitch three weeks before the tournament in Equatorial Guinea, in Mongomo, dumb laying down the, the sod, there are not being enough hotel and accommodation in Mongomo. And, you know, these football administrators that are used to five-star hotel rooms, you know, having to share an apartment, some sleeping on a couch, some sleeping on the floor. There's a very much an understanding on the continent that the African Cup of Nations is going to be played. No matter how angry the European clubs are, no matter the health pet pandemics and epidemics, we're going to do our very best to play this tournament every two years. And I really do believe that that starts with the inaugural edition in 1957 and with Gamal Abdel Nasser's decision 
decision, apologies, to, um, to play that tournament. For example, uh, Egypt boycotted the 1956 Olympic Games. So just a few months prior to that, along with uh, Iraq, Cambodia, and Lebanon uh, in protest of Britain and France's involvement in the Suez crisis. Um, but they played that 1957 AFCON. And so that was really something that I think Nasser deserves credit for. So at the inaugural uh, edition, um, Egypt wins quite handily. Uh, again, they're the best team on the continent. And after the tournament, they really entrench their their positions in the Confederation of African Football. The headquarters of CAF are, 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 are based in Cairo now. Uh, there's a new CAF president. The, the first was Egyptian and the second... Sorry, there's a new CAF president. The first was Egyptian. The second was also Egyptian. Uh, Nasser places his right-hand man, Abdul Hakim Amr, who he was in the military academy with, um, as the Egyptian FA president. That's that's pretty crazy when you think about it. That's like, I'm trying to think of your, of your equivalent, um, but that's like putting a secretary of state or, you know, a minister of defense as the Egyptian FA president. And they decide to host the 1959, 1959 Africa Cup of Nations at home. Um and I think they run away with it again, but I think this is one of the Egyptian sides that is most overlooked because when you see how star-studded they were with players like Rabat al Fanagili, Salah Salim, I mean, they had so many good players. His brother Tariq Salim. These are players that I think were television around. They would have become household names and they would have enjoyed much more success. But because there wasn't any television, because uh, we were barely surviving on radio at the time, uh, I think it's an Egyptian generation that is forgotten about, but at the same time, I think it's one of the best in African football history. In 1960, Gamal Abdel Nasser inaugurates the Cairo International Stadium, one of the most iconic stadiums uh, in African football, uh, site of you know the uh, 2009 Egypt-Algeria match, site of the 1986 African Cup of Nations, 2019 Africa Cup of Nations. Um, just a, an iconic, mythical stadium when you think about all the Champions Leagues that are won there by, by Al-Ahli. And initially, this was the stadium was named Nasser Stadium, but now we all know it as Cairo International Stadium. In 1962, uh, the AFCON is in Ethiopia. Uh, Egypt failed to three-peat and win the tournament three times. Uh, Ghana would end up winning, and that would actually be the last African Cup of Nations that Egypt participated in. In under Gemal Abdel Nasser, because in 1965 the Tunisian president Habib Bourguiba uh, gives a controversial statement in which he calls the Arab leaders to make peace with Israel. This angers several African and Arab nations, and the 1965 Afcon was going to take place in Tunisia. And so, because of Bourguiba's statements, uh, nations including Egypt boycott the tournament. So, 1965 Egypt does not play, uh, and the next tournament is in 1968. But one year before. And the next tournament is 1968. But one year prior, we have the Six-Day War and the suspension of sporting activity in Egypt. So the 1967 Six-Day War is one of the greatest humiliations in Arab world history. Uh, Egypt loses control of the Sinai Desert and, and Israel, really, they go and they, um, they occupy several different regions across the Arab world. Um, and... As the war breaks out, uh, Al Ahli and the, the entire league is suspended. Al Ahli announced that the club will host military training for their members, uh, as well as those that are volunteering in the Egyptian army. Clubs are also collecting donations in the name of the club. Um, and really, there's no more sport for the next, I would say, almost decade. Um, and after the Six Day War, Nasser uh, tenders his resignation. It's refused by the people. They, they come out in the street in droves and they maintain him in power. And three years later, he dies of a heart attack while he is still quite young. And so Nasser's legacy in sport is one of trailblazing. I mean, he's quite clearly not the most football mad leader, but he knew how to use politics to develop sport and vice versa. Um, and because of the massive strides and the integral role that Nasser's Egypt played in the foundation of the Confederation of African Football, we just had to include him in our African uh, five-a-side team. So he'll be our goalkeeper. We'll place him right there. 
And uh, next week, we're going to examine the legacy of another African head of state. I'll give you a hint. He has a PhD. He's a very close friend of Nasser, and he even has uh, some Egyptian family. So thanks so much for watching. Um, please, if you've liked this, don't hesitate to subscribe on YouTube. Uh, also on any audio platform that you'd like if you can give a five star rating give a five star if you can give a thumbs up do that as well uh, it helps us so much and uh, yeah we'll see you next week for another episode of the african fireside podcast